The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Ooh, that football animation makes you dodge every now and then. Good morning, folks. This is Jacob Shoup. I'm filling in for Tommy O'Brien. He will be back with us on Monday. An interesting kind of day setting up here, guys. We'll get into that a little bit. Before I begin, I'm going to look at the SPY real quick. Closing at, well, trading right now at 432. Uh, as we open up at 930. Tom yesterday in the den was calling this, right? He said, we're probably going to have a 60-point close in the SPX. And if you guys, and he was right. I think it closed probably 72, if I remember correctly. You guys have got to get into the den. And this is going to be my plug, all right? And I'll make it real quick so we can talk a little bit about the market. You come to TFNN.com. You scroll down. Recommend taking a look at uh, Tim Ord's webinar. It's going to be November 7th. That's next Tuesday. Check that out. But for right now, we're going to switch over right here to the Tiger's Den trading room, guys. This is $1 a year. We just do that so we can keep everyone safe and secure and know who's in there, right? I, that's standard practice. Do $1 a year. You go ahead and subscribe. You click this link. You download Discord. Create an account. And then you're going to click this. This is the invite link. It's going to get you in the den. You're not going to see everything immediately. Because then you're going to have to email sales at tfnn.com with your account name. I'll give you the tag, and then you're going to be able to interact with everyone. Get these sweet insights very early in the morning so you don't get left behind throughout the day. Guys, it's a four-set process. Very simple. We have FAQs there and everything as well. I really recommend getting in there. I think we have about 630 total people. We have a bunch of people active all day long, and I just had like five signups this week in general. It's amazing. Everyone's loving it. All right, let's take a look, guys. We have the ES Mini trading about 43.56 right now. We have the Russell at 17.49.50 cents and Qs at 15,034. Then they had Dow Futures at 34,074. The gold contract, we're down a little bit right now at 2008. Or excuse me, we're up. We were, I think, trading at 19 something yesterday. A nice tick up earlier this morning at 8.30. Uh, so we're going to take a look at why that might be. We have the silver contract trading at 23.27 copper at $3.67, and then crude oil at 82. Staying pretty stable right there, okay? We might have some issues going forward with uh, everything occurring in the Levant between Israel and Palestine. Uh, there might be some issues with the Strait of Hormuz going forward, especially since it is Iranian controlled. And there is some evidence that uh, Iran, some elements in Iran, such as Hezbollah, might be helping Hamas in a way. Let's take a look here. We'll look at the dollar. It took a nosedive today, pre-market. We're at 105.36. Right, so we have an interesting confluence going on, okay? Apple came out with their numbers. We'll talk about them in a second. Basically, receding sales, okay? They're losing market share in China, losing out to Huawei. One second. And their sales units were down. All right. So let's see. We had Apple fell about. Here, we'll pull this up, actually. So we're not just looking at crude oil for no reason. So you had it out. This is about the 430 mark here. You dip down to about 175. Here we go. We had this huge bar down, 173.46. Um, came back up a little bit. And then you had a low right here of 160, about 169.33, and you were settling at about 171 uh, until about this morning where you took a bid up here at 177.74. Um, they didn't have great numbers. Uh, they weren't abysmal or anything. Um, and they also had a cautious outlook. So we'll read a little bit about this. Apple stock fell as much 2% pre-market Trading on Friday after the iPhone maker reported earnings late Thursday that they did beat estimates, uh, though a cautious outlook for the current quarter weighed on shares. The, a main thing that was driving this was going to be its wearables, right? They had less um, iPad sales, 
iPhone sales were a little bit shaky on it. Again, they're losing out on China quite a bit. Um, but their wearables, their peripherals uh, did pretty well. Apple reported earnings about 146 on revenue. I think the expected on that was 139, if I remember correctly, on some analysts. So that's is better. Uh, that reached about revenue of uh, 89.5 billion, um, it, which was expected of 89.3, and that was a fourth straight quarter revenue. Um, basically, it was moving that way. Uh, the company said that iPhone sales had increased to 43.8 billion in its fourth quarter, which is slightly beating expectations. Services revenue surpassed 22 billion for the first time, so the services were big. But the idea is that the outlook for the coming quarter is not great. All right. So Apple makes up a pretty large portion of it. I think they're at like one trillion market cap. They're now below that, obviously. Um, so, you know, this has uh, I, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I was I was interested in, in maybe trying to find a short position. Right. You've had about, you know, if today's up, which trends I don't I, I get nervous thinking of trends reversing on Fridays. Um, if this is another update. We've seen at least in the recent past, you know, five days up, and then you get a downturn again, right? Now, the market conditions are a little bit different. We have the dollar actually going down and breaking that 106 level, where, where it was sitting pretty comfortably about 106.10 to 106.20. We're now at 105.39. If that is a real dive, obviously that lifts the market up. So I, I wouldn't, you know, might personally look at a short position that way at all. Um, if Apple doesn't get hit as poorly either. I, I also think that's not a great, that, that would go against the thesis of trying to short it a little bit. Um, so we're in an interesting kind of spot, at least the way that I'm looking at things. Um, another thing that can kind of lift the market and really send it off, uh, the US payrolls increased uh, 150,000 in October, but that actually was less than expected. There was a forecasted estimate of uh, 170,000. So, you know, we're still having job growth, Okay, but it's slowing down a little bit. This kind of lends credence a little bit to the concept of not raising rates this time around from the Fed. Uh, the market also likes that quite a bit. Uh, might be getting into a bottom, at least in the bond market with that as well. The metals will go off in this kind of uh, circumstance, especially with the dollar. If we stay sub 106, if we stay in these mid 105 areas, it'll be pretty massive. Uh, the non-farm payrolls increased 150,000 for the month. The Labor Department reported Friday against the Dow Jones consensus forecast for an increase of 170,000. The United Auto Workers strike was primarily responsible for the gap as the impasse meant a net loss of jobs for the manufacturing industry. And that's something to keep in mind as well. Give me one second. I got to pull up program here. Okay, we got it going. We'll talk a little bit more about the UAW strikes. Now, if those strikes cease right and normal operations resume i i could see a world where some of these jobs do get cut right i mean i think stellantis just passed like a 1.8 billion dollar i'll have to look that up 1.8 billion dollar kind of a deal with uaw on going forward i know uaw is gearing to organize up in toyota we'll talk about that a little bit as well and so we might see a persistent kind of lower job uh excuse me payroll number uh, in the coming months, which, you know, is positive for the market. Is that a permanent thing? Is that really showing that the rates are working? It's hard to say. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. 
Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything, from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Folks, uh, before we went to the break, we're talking a little about U.S. job numbers, what this general trend might look like. Uh, you know, I was talking about maybe setting up like a short op uh, opportunity in the market. But essentially what I'm looking at here right now, we're talking a little bit about UAW um, and kind of the jobless numbers as well. And if these UAW strikes, well, one, you know, they are contributing uh, to this kind of payroll number. Um, is that going to be long lasting Do these larger deals? Are they going to translate into lower numbers of employees going forward? Anyways, we're looking at this here. The UAW Stellantis deal includes an 18.9, I said 1.8, I was off on that. It's 18.9 billion in investments and in new trucks for idle plants, okay? So the planned, they, they pushed Chrysler parent Stellantis to invest about 18.9 billion in the US by April 2028, including 1.5 billion for new uh, mid-sized pickup truck production at an idled factory in Belvedere, Illinois. The investments are expected to be completed during the term of a four and a half year tentative agreement, which must still be ratified by roughly 43,000 UAW members covered by the proposed contract at Solantis. Okay, the concept is if you're revitalizing some of these idled factories, it's going to add more to the payroll, and that is an argument to be made as well. But there's always a way that some jobs get cut in something like this. Uh, details of the tentative agreement were released Thursday night after local UAW leaders approved the pact, which UAW Sean Fain called the most lucrative contract our union has won in decades. There you go. Um, on that as well, they are moving out into Toyota as well. The UAW on Thursday signaled the next step in the union's campaign to capitalize on its success and bargaining with the Detroit Three is launching organizing drives at Toyota, Tesla, and other non-union U.S. auto factories. Sean Fain again began his video comments on Stellantis' contract with an appeal to workers at Toyota which on Wednesday offered pay and benefit increases after the Detroit three contact, excuse me, three contract talks uh, concluded. He said that the UAW's new contracts were so good they had led to non-union auto workers getting raises, terrified auto executives across the nation. Okay, we get the point, right? I, I just, I, 
you, you know, you, you reach this like hard position, right? Because you want people to be able to make more. Like things are so expensive. Uh, you know, it's expensive to live. Um, things are going up in price um, and it's, it's just a little bit difficult, right? So you want other workers, you know, especially blue collar guys who are working in factories like this, right? Like they're supporting families and they're just, they, they make up America, right? Like they make up this nation. And I don't, I, I, I fear that stuff like this though also increases the, the price of the goods, you know? So then you kind of get this whole runaround situation where, all right, so now the union workers are making a lot more money. These companies are not gonna charge more for these cars. I mean, Toyota, the, the CEO came out a few months ago and said he sees the base price of new vehicles being 50,000, right? And I could see a world where that uh, comes you know, not in the next few years, but, you know, in the next, what, like, decade or something like that. And that might be out of the reach of a lot of people. You know, um, obviously, that just kind of adds more into the kind of debt cycle that we have in the U.S., where, you know, you take out loans to purchase things. That obviously also pushes up prices of things in a roundabout way as well. Um, so it's kind of just interesting to sit and, like, think about it. You could talk with your friends or whatever, maybe not your relatives about it, because that gets rough. But, um, I don't know. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the market right now, and um, I wonder what the kind of paradigm shift in looking at it will be going forward. So let's take a look at here. Looking at more permanent layoffs and everything here, Charles Schwab, uh, they just acquired TD Ameritrade. They've laid 5 to 6% of its workforce off. It's about 2,000 employees. The company had 35,900 employees at the end of September, according to Charles Schwab's latest quarterly report meaning this week's cuts could impact roughly 2,000 employees. Uh, they were, these were hard but necessary steps to ensure Schwab remains highly competitive with industry-leading levels of efficiency and well into the future. Uh, they are decisions that impact very talented people personally, and we take that very seriously. Okay, how many of these people, though, can go get a job afterwards? We can take a look at some of the actual jobless uh, claims in a second here out of AP. The Westlake, Texas-based company previously said it projected to achieve at least $500 million of incremental annual run rate cost savings, while also incurring about $400 million to $500 million from expenses like employee compensation, benefits, and facility exit costs. For the third quarter of 2023, Schwab posted a net income of $1.1 billion, which is down from $2 billion seen in the same period last year. Revenue was $4.6 billion for the quarter, down $5.5 billion from the third quarter of 2022. Their shares are down about 34% year to date, but up 3% in the Thursday morning trading. So we're seeing a lot of factors go in here. Let me try to find this. Uh, here we go. And this is the thing. This is coming out. We're on the third today. Oh, and speaking of that, I, I feel like we missed like a really good chance to have a cool Halloween stream on them. But hey, you know what? We'll get it next year. Uh, U.S. applications here for jobless benefits came out yesterday, uh, inch higher, but still remain at historically healthy levels. The number of Americans applying for jobless benefits inched up last week, but remains by, excuse me, remains low by historical standards, even with the Federal Reserve's aggressive interest rate hikes meant to cool the economy and taper lingering inflation. Unemployment claims rose by 5,000 to 217,000 for the week ending October 28th. The Labor Department reported Thursday jobless claim applications are seen as representative of number of layoffs in a given week. The four-week moving average of claims, which quiet some of the week-to-week -week ups and downs, ticked up by 2,000 to 210,000. All right, and again, you could still make the argument, since these are healthy levels, are these rates doing enough? Like, what is the long-term view of the Fed and when they're seeking, you know, and I think, too, like, not having, like, a time frame for when the Feds want to see this kind of occur and, you know, get inflation back down to 2% or whatever, um, I think we're still in the woods. I don't know if the Fed really knows either. I, I think we can sit here and, you know, part of, you know, what we as traders do is try to come up with theses and understand what the long-term outlook is so we can make these kind of decisions. Um, but I also think that we're getting at a point, too, where we're still in the woods and we're not seeing a, a massive change in everything, right? Still, there is still something going, but we're at, what, 5.2%, 5.25%? And uh, it's, it's not changing in the exact way. So we might still have incremental increases throughout 2024, um, which obviously kind of uh, chokes the market out a little bit. Let's take a look here. This is for, oh man, where is it at? 
It's for Dan. I don't know if he's in the den yet. I kind of want to wait until he's listening to see if he has any uh, interesting input on that. Um, but we can just take a look here. Let's take a look at Amazon versus some general news, looking at everything going on. Hitting about 138.84, uh, up modestly about half a percent. They've been trying to get into brick and mortar for quite a while. And currently they are closing the two clothing stores, uh, which is, as they're saying, another failed bid into physical retail. The company said Thursday that it will close both of its Amazon-style stores located in L.A. and Columbus, Ohio. It's an interesting choice. Uh, making it the latest brick-and-mortar business abandoned by Amazon. Amazon opened the first Amazon-style store last year at the, uh, excuse me, at the Americana at Brand. Jeez, <laughs> these names. Uh, a, mall, a mall in Glendale, California. Uh, some experts predicted the company's entry could threaten traditional retailers like Macy's and Kohl's, but Amazon's ambitions into physical retail haven't always panned out. Last year, Amazon closed all of its brick-and-mortar bookstores, as well as its four-star shops and pop-up locations, and said the move would enable it to concentrate on other physical businesses, including Amazon Fresh and its style stores. And they also are getting into uh, pharmaceutical delivery with uh, drones, which I think is going to be pretty big if they can get that right. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30-plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you ready to take your trading to the next level? Introducing Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, your key to successful active trading. Tom O'Brien, renowned for his expertise in the financial markets, has designed Market Insights to be your daily guide to profitable trades. Tom publishes his daily Market Insights newsletter every market day before the market open, along with updates when warranted. Stay ahead of the game with Tom's real-time analysis and trade recommendations delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a seasoned trader or just starting out, Market Insights provides the edge you need to navigate the markets with confidence. Ready to join the ranks of successful traders? Head over to TFNN.com and subscribe to Market Insights today. Don't miss out on this opportunity to supercharge your trading results. Market Insights comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for all new subscribers, so you have nothing to risk. Don't miss out on this opportunity to revolutionize your trading game. Head over to TFNN.com right now to join the thousands of traders who have already experienced the power of Tom O'Brien's award-winning newsletter, Market Insights, firsthand. TFNN, educating investors. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, welcome back, folks. We have the market open. Uh, Spy is trading at 433, Apple at 174. 
uh, at about, well, it's fighting right now, but about 174. Disney at 84.37, Meta trading at 312, Google 129, QQQs 364, the dollar down at 105.30. Steel Dynamics broke above the 110 boundary. And uh, let me see here. Yeah, it really did break above. Not on extreme volume or anything like that. So we'll see if we get a retrace. It, well, really, the way I've been playing this stock, and I, I talk about it all the time, but I mean, it, since, you know, June, you can just you can just ride it. Hits its 110, comes back down to 100. Hits its 110, comes right back down. 110, back down. And when you find a stock like that, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Now, of course, you know, given volume, like you had a breakdown here on high volume, that in theory sets up for lower prices. Um... But that was in September 15th, and we're at November 3rd right now. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think this reach up to the stars, 115, it's not on immense volume. So we might see a trace back down, but it's a fun stock to look at and play. Tesla at 221, up about 1.10% right now. Silver, 2306. Gold ticking down right now at one, excuse me, 1998. We breached above uh, 2000 mark here. Um, I think earlier this morning as well, about 2021. All right, let's take a look. We have DraftKings. They're up about 6.49%. Revenue jumped 57%. Sportsbook leader grows customer base. Sports betting company DraftKings on Thursday posted quarterly revenue that came in ahead of analyst expectations as the company rises to the top of the highly competitive online gambling industry. Shares from DraftKings... Uh, gained about 7% in extended trading Thursday after rising 6% during regular session. Loss per share was $0.61. Cents. Revenue $790 million versus $706.8 million expected. It wasn't immediate clear whether the company's reported loss per share was comparable to the $0.69 cent loss expected by analysts. DraftKings reported a net loss of $283.1 million or $0.61 cents per share compared to the loss of $450.5 million or $1 per share in the same period a year earlier. Revenue for the third quarter increased 57% to $790 million. The company said growth was spurred by its expansion into new jurisdictions, which led to a boost in new customers. All the while, existing customers were more engaged and spent more money on the platform. That's also a good sign as well. Um, fantastic third quarter results demonstrate the positive impact of our product and technology investments, as well as excellent preparation and execu excuse me, execution uh, by our entire organization. That was from the CEO. Uh, they reported 2.3 million monthly unique payers in the third quarter, representing a 40% increase year over year. And the average revenue per monthly unique payer increased 14%, which is, again, it's a really good sign that their current uh, customer base is interacting more with it. Let me see real quick. I think Dan's in the chat now. I want to talk about this a little bit, right? So this is news, and this kind of, you know, goes in a little bit with uh, some of the science news that I like talking about. There's an issue that's coming up, and I mean, I don't think it's as pressing as everyone makes it out to be, um, but a lot of the, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of bacteria that's gaining antibiotic resistance, okay? Even out here, we have something called Bayboro, right, which is right off of uh, the USF campus, University of South Florida, and uh, how do you call it? The, the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard base. It's right in there. And we used to go sailing in that water, okay? Not a lot of people like swim in it, right? Especially if you're from here, you don't go to those beaches that much. You, you know, you don't get in the water at all. Uh, but we had to go sailing in there. And I was doing some research on it. And the laboratory at USF had determined in 2016 that there was antibiotic resistant bacteria in the water, right? And this is due because we have a lot of hospitals around the area and some of the waste gets flushed, you know, north of that, right? Um, and so one of the big fears going into the next, you know, going into the rest of the century is that there's going to be a lot of like standard bacteria that is now antibiotic resistant. And if you look at what the Eastern Bloc has done historically, right, we, we bifurcated, I think, in the 50s um, when, we, when we discovered antibiotics, right? Prior to that, we had something called bacteriophages, which were viruses um, that could be trained essentially to, you know, the, the name bacteriophage means bacteria eater, and so it would essentially be, inf you, the host would be infected, and it would kill the bacteria, okay? And there's ways you can make these mixtures that they don't necessarily become resistant to these bacteriophages. Well, one of the biggest kind of infections we have in the U.S. is gonorrhea, okay? 
And the problem is you get a, about a bunch of young people who get infected with this and they're given um, antibiotics and they don't finish their entire course. So maybe their symptoms go away, uh, but it still exists latently. Um, and you just essentially get this antibiotic resistant gonorrhea that goes around, okay? And so this is a new antibiotic. It shows promise for drug resistant gonorrhea, which is massive, okay? Second most common uh, infection in the US developed resistant to all antibiotics used to treat it, except for the recommended combined therapy of an injection of the antibiotic um, ceftriaxone with one dose of uh, azithromycin. I could say that word, actually. I know what that is. <laughs> On Wednesday, results from a late-stage clinical trial of a new antibiotic called zoloflodicin showed the drug cured so-called uncomplicated gonorrhea infections as effectively as the cetria fox, okay, let's say it's ceftriaxone and the azithromycin, we're gonna just say the drugs going forward. Drug was developed by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, a Swiss nonprofit and US based uh, in Aviva Specialty Therapeutics. We have Dan in the den, he's a big uh, biotech guy and um, thought he might have some interesting input into that. But yeah, going forward, I think we're going to see a lot of efforts into kind of new ways of treating um, bacterial infections. It's massive. And this kind of this stuff go, going untreated can be pretty like devastating to people in general. So anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting when I was reading it earlier, because those are one of the things I, I kind of think of, um, you know, later in the evening. Uh, <laughs> This is interesting here. We have Japan is actually approving a $110 billion stimulus package to fight inflation. Okay, so we're kind of like, how does that work, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit. Japan's cabinet approved on Thursday a package of economic measures worth about 7 trillion yen, which is 112 billion, including income tax cuts. Uh, the new prime minister uh, was grappling with persistent inflation and following approval ratings. Wage increases are not keeping pace with price rises, okay? And so the idea here basically is that this stimulus, because usually you don't add a stimulus package to fight inflation. And really what's going on is Japan has historically dealt with deflation. They're experiencing inflation, but not in the way they really want it. They want it to be demand-based inflation, right? And they have lower demand, okay? And so the idea is that stimulating the economy would increase demand and therefore increase supply. And so you could actually get you know, a lower inflation number or an equal inflation number to I think about 3% they're dealing with um, currently. And that will be driven from uh, demand. And they're, they're achieving this via tax cuts one, which is interesting. And then for the lowest earners in the economy themselves, uh, they're getting actual just straight up checks in order to start spending some more to switch basically what I'm saying is the cause of inflation in Japan. And, and really, again, historically, they deal with deflation. I think this is kind of like, I don't think this article really explains that very well, uh, nor does this headline. I mean, I think that to new people, you know, grappling with economics, this doesn't make any sense. But that's what's going on essentially. I think that's kind of a unique way to deal with some stuff. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Tigers. Every Tuesday and Thursday, Tim Orr joins the Tom O'Brien Show to share his unique insight that he's developed over decades of trading. Now, on Tuesday, November 7th, from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Tim Ord will be hosting his own live webinar. Tim's analysis has been outperforming market returns by almost double, and his gold analysis is on track to be a winner as well. Tim will be delving into six secret ratios that every trader should know. In this webinar, Tim will be covering the daily TLT VIX, the daily and weekly SPY VIX, the American Association of Individual Investors bull bear ratios, and the trend panic levels. Tim will break down each ratio, how it is calculated, its importance, and how it can help you make bigger returns. It's as simple as this. Learn the ratios, trade by them, and see your returns. That's it. Visit the front page of TFNN.com today to sign up now. TFNN. Educating investors. 
You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Will the S&P 500 continue to climb? For bold trades on U.S. large cap stocks in either direction, trade SPXL, SPUU, or SPXS. Direction's daily S&P 500 bull and bear leveraged ETFs. Direction leveraged ETFs. An investor should carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses before investing. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about Direction shares. To obtain a fund's prospectus and summary prospectus, call 866-476-7523 or visit directioninvestments.com. A fund's prospectus and summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the fund is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. All right, welcome back, guys. Um, looking at Moderna right now, uh, they obviously got hit pretty heavily. The other day, they had a steep loss for the third quarter, recorded a large write-down due to unused doses of the COVID vaccine, its only marketable product, and unveiled plans to scale back production of the shot. They closed 6% lower on Thursday. Moderna's turtle, excuse me, total revenue uh, for the period topped Wall Street's expectations, even amid plummeting demand for its shot. Its outlook for next year, however, came in lower what analysts were projecting. Uh, the loss per share was $9.53. That may not be comparable to the $1.93 per share expected by analysts. Revenue was $1.83 billion versus $1.4 billion expected. Moderna posted a net loss of $3.63 billion, or $9.53 share for the quarter. That compares with net income of $1.04 billion, or $2.53 per share, reported during the year period. Excuse me, year ago period. All right. So why is it up right now? Okay, well, they had just basically come out with something saying they have a new antigen vaccine for cancer therapy. And this could be pretty interesting. Um, they reduced 50% distant uh, metastases and deaths, uh, which is obviously pretty impressive if that's a number you can see across the board. If that comes out, you know, a cancer vaccine is the way that people are running to do things. Uh, I'm interested to see, I, I got to read a little bit more. I mean, neo antigen vaccine obviously kind of talks a little bit about its mechanism. Um, but I think this, that could be neat if it's, uh, you know, long-term. So I think that personally might be a reason why we're seeing an increase right now, uh, even though it's, you know, obviously going forward into the future, uh, COVID probably won't be as large of an issue um, and they won't be making as many COVID vaccines. So that's interesting. I'll, I'll read a little bit more about that and maybe I'll post something in the den uh, later today about why uh, that could be happening. I think it's interesting. All right, we can talk a little bit too, uh, since we talked about cybersecurity a little bit on this uh, Fortinet. Let me get the ticker for it real quick. Get what it is. Yeah, okay. So that tumbled, and you know, I stress pretty heavily how important cybersecurity is going forward. They're down, geez, down 17.5% right now. I mean, that's a huge gap down, right? 
It sank, this is saying 23% at least, and sparked a sell off in cybersecurity stocks with a dismal forecast that compounded fears of slowing client spending in an uncertain economy. The current pre market loss, if they hold, were set to wipe out more than $18 billion from the company's market value. Palo Alto, Zscaler, CrowdStrike fell between about 25 and 3.8%. Fortinet cut its annual revenue target on Thursday and said it expects current quarter sales between $1.38 billion versus $1.44 billion, below estimates of $1.5 billion. Again, I, I think this is like not a smart thing for a lot of companies to do. Yeah, you're, you're cutting down on security. I, again, I think, and I've said this before, that it still seems kind of like arcane to a lot of people. I think the CEOs of the future... You know, right now we have a lot of guys who are, you know, either in finance or, you know, lawyers or something like this. Um, but you're, you're going to ha- need to have people at that top level who are competent in security, right? The fact that you, you're seeing a downspending right now, okay, in cybersecurity, while globally you're seeing an uptick in cybercrime. I mean, we, we just had the casinos get smacked with, with a massive kind of ransom for this, right? And... I, what, what I really fear about this is you, you're looking at, like, the C-suite executives are sitting there saying, well, what is the average kind of net loss on this, right? They're, they're looking at it in a quantitative way, right? And they're saying, okay, well, maybe we can uh, accept that loss if it hits us. What are, what are the chances? What, are, what is, our, like, our exposure of this? And if we get hit, can we afford to pay uh, some ransom like this? But that's a really bad way to look at it, okay? Because long-term, one, you, you make yourself a target. Okay, if, if you go ahead and you pay these ransoms um, or you get hacked. And then, and then second, what really happens, and this I would blame the consumer on this a little bit as well, but a lot of these breaches end up in, in mass exfiltration of um, sensitive data of consumers, right? So if you're just looking at it in a quantitative way, it's like, okay, well, we lose $100 million from this ransom. But you're also, you know, compromising, uh, let's say, your, you know, the, the credit card numbers or, or whatever, of a lot of these uh, consumers, like that's messed up just on a, on a general level, right? Like that's a qualitative issue. Like you, you are now putting your consumers at risks. Now, I, I think too, a lot of consumers also don't understand this. So when it happens, they're just like, well, you know, this, these things happen and, and the, the company that was targeted where our data was lost through uh, is also a victim. And, and the truth of the matter is that a lot of the times these guys are not employing proper precautions whatsoever because they're under investing in security. I, I think that we will see government or legislative push into more of these companies taking the burden um, when they get hit like this. And um, I, I think that would be a really beautiful thing. I, I have an acquaintance of mine who is, he basically works on like back end infrastructure and security is a part of that. And he's, we're sitting there at a cafe and he's complaining about the company, and he's showing me the back end of this company. You know, he got fired from it, his contract got terminated, but they never sat there and changed the password. So this man could still access the back end. And this is just some random person to them now, right? They're, he's not bound by anything beyond his personal morals. And like, that's insane. And this was like, you know, it's not a large company or anything like that, but it has a pretty um, impactful role. And, uh, it's just it's just insane, and, and to see less investment on this, I think, is just not a smart thing. Anyways, I'm going to stop kind of sitting on the soapbox with that in general. Um, but just to know that I think for this year, cybersecurity investment is uh, is not doing well, at least. And now probably extended to 2024. I mean, as long as the economy is not, like, setting on fire, rather the corporations aren't, like, on fire, there's not a ton of money going through, and they're looking to make cuts somewhere, cybersecurity clearly is one of those things on the chopping block, um, which I think is pretty wild. Some news for the crypto bros. XRP, which is Ripple, actually was approved by Dubai's Financial Services Authority, which is pretty insane. Um, XRP fell about 0.28% uh, in the 24 hours leading up to 5.30 p.m. in Hong Kong. And that traded about 0.60 uh, uh, right there at that level. Ripple's flagship event, Ripple Swell, is set to begin in Dubai on November 8th, aiming to bring together influential voices from the financial and regulatory industries. And uh, yeah, we're just seeing a more widespread kind of adoption of crypto in some of these other countries. So Ripple's pretty stable. Um, there's a lot of good talk. Uh, at least the, the Ripple bros love the stock, obviously, you know. So I think that's interesting. Um, 
Let me see here. AMD, is this something to talk about as well? So we're up about 1%. Um, you, you had a big shoot up actually yesterday, uh, which is pretty insane. From 99 up to about 107. They beat earnings estimates. They are missing Q4 guidance. While it beat estimates on top of the bottom line, the company missed on its Q4 guidance. AMD shares fell about 4 point cent, uh, excuse me, 4% after I was trading. This is from November 1st. But they gained it back. Uh, the loss of optimism about its latest dinners, excuse me, data center chips grew. The stock is up about 8% on Wednesday. And uh, we were talking about between AMD and NVIDIA that they actually produce different, like their chips are different, right? And the concept behind it is a NVIDIA is you being used for training AIs on things and AMD is being used to sustain it. So, you know, they're, they're still in competition with each other 100%, but if those guys can specialize that way and AMD can specialize into that being the smaller guy, it might be okay going forward. Folks, stay tuned. We have a short segment coming up after this. The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com. Educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. Beautiful Friday morning. We are ready for the weekend, no doubt. Talking a little bit about Maersk right now, it's obviously the world's largest shipping here. Shipping company Maersk to slash 10,000 jobs, citing the difficult container trade environment. This is out of Denmark. Maersk, the world's biggest shipping company, said Friday that it plans to eliminate 10,000 jobs due to what it described as a challenging environment for container trade and logistics. And just let me say real quick, 
we're going to go back to the cybersecurity thing. You want to see the effect that uh, a cyber attack can have. You got to look up not Petya Maersk. Okay, that was a that was a virus designed for Ukraine, but it somehow ended up infecting Maersk infrastructure. It, it was disastrous. You've got to read this up. So, anyways, the company said the move would result in savings of 600 million in 2024, which is astounding. The announcement was made as the Copenhagen-based Maersk presented its quarterly report, which listed profits uh, for taxes at 691 million, down from 9.1 billion for the same period last year. The report cited challenging market conditions resulting in substantially lower freight rates compared to abnormally high rates in 2022. AP Moeller Maersk CEO Vincent Clerk said the company will continue to streamline its organizations and operations. Our industry is facing a new normal with subdued demand. It's a key thing here. Prices back in line with historical levels and inflationary pressures on our cost base. Given the challenging times ahead, we accelerated several cost and cash containment measures to safeguard our financial performance. The company's revenue for Q3 was $12.1 billion, compared to $22.8 billion for the same period in 2022, which is pretty substantial. The news going forward there, especially when it affects you know, shipping, you can see that kind of ripple in to the rest of the global economy. Furthermore, Six Flags and Cedar Fair are going to merge, which is weird. Uh, I can't remember the last time I went to any of these. Cedar is obviously way better. Obviously, Six Flags is up 6.93%. Uh, Six Flags shareholders will receive 0.58 shares of stock in the combined company for each share owned. Cedar Fair uh, unit holders will receive one share of common stock in the combined company for each unit owned. This is an interesting approach. I, I think Cedar Fair is just way better than Six Flags. It looks a lot nicer. I don't know. Um, it's interesting to see them kind of acquire some of that because I feel like it might cheapen the brand a little bit. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. We will have Tommy on Monday. Have a great weekend, folks.